Okay, I think we can start. Um, so, hello. Uh, my name is Gabriel Ryan. I'm a security engineer at uh, GDS. And uh, basically today I'm going to be talking about, well, not quite war driving. I mean, war driving is kind of been beaten to a dead horse at this point. But uh, I, I guess slightly a more, um, I, I think a more interesting topic, which is, you know, tracking uh, client devices, tracking wireless devices that people carry around. And also, uh, you know, with it, implicitly, uh, tracking the people that use them, use them. So, I mean, before we go into this, uh, into this topic, I think it's, it's only right that we, we talk about war driving, uh, mainly because, you know, it, it's kind of the precursor to a lot of the stuff we're going to talk about today. Uh, so, you know, war driving, I mean, as you probably know, is the process of, um, you know, you pretty much map wireless networks and devices to a physical location. So, I mean, it's, it's partially a geospatial intelligence analysis problem and partially a wireless recon problem. Uh, incorporates elements of both. So, uh, but I, I guess like, you know, whereas his typical war driving really focuses on just, you know, creating maps of wireless networks and, and, and so on and so forth, um, you know, we should ask ourselves, you know, why, why not cl uh, track client devices as well? And what can we get from this? Well, you know, whereas mapping access points gives you information about organizations, attack services, uh, coverage, you know, signal leakage, et cetera. Uh, tracking client devices gives you information about people. So, you know, whereas APs and, and, and um, you know, infrastructure that you're mapping, uh, I mean, that's, that's really just facilitating uh, these devices that are used to communicate. Uh, if you're actually, you know, taking a look at client devices, these are the devices that are allowing you to communicate themselves. So it, it's, it's definitely a more humanistic uh, kind of approach there and, and gives you, you know, a lot of an insight about, you know, organizations and, and people working within them. So another good reason is, you know, Pew Research Center, 92% of Americans own a cell phone. 90% uh, of owners carry their cell phone with them frequently. And, uh, you know, you can imagine if you're, if you're always carrying, you know, a device around, um, that's a pretty good way to um, associate that with a person. You can use that to, to, to track people. So, I mean, your cell phone alone uses Wi-Fi, uh, cell cellular, you know, has Bluetooth capabilities, RFID capabilities possibly, uh, possibly infrared or ultrasound. You know, you can get that through mics and, and speakers. GPS, if it's not enabled, and of course we also have RFID, um, you know, which is, you know, you wouldn't think about these, you know, off the top of your head, but uh, building access cards, uh, credit cards, you know, just stuff you carry around you that actually, you know, does have some kind of RFID component to it. You know, this is a 50-minute talk, so, and it's a pretty broad topic, so I'm going to focus mainly on Wi-Fi, uh, but there's also a lot of applications with, with the other stuff that we talked about. So, uh, the other interesting thing about tracking client devices is that it's more challenging uh, you know, unlike access points, which typically don't grow a pair of legs and walk across the room too much, uh, you know, your, your typical cell phone moves around a lot because it's being carried by a person. They also have much lower transmit power, and, you know, there are a lot of them in one place. You know, you, you typically don't have to worry about, you know, 100 access points, you know, in one room at once, unless you're at B-Sides or, or DEF CON or something, and, uh, uh, you know, people are messing with the Wi-Fi. But, you know, typically when you're, when you're analyzing data coming from client devices, there are a lot of them, so there's a lot more data you have to sift through. So I guess the fundamental technique uh, using, uh, th that goes into tracking uh, wireless devices, um, specifically clients, is probe sniffing. Very basic, once again. Um, but, you know, in, in case, who here is familiar about uh, the network discovery process uh, used by wireless devices? Show of hands. All right. I see some people who didn't raise their hands, so just for the sake of not, you know, don't, I'll, I'll try to make this brief, but you know, to not bore you guys, but also I'll try to cover it. <laughs> so, um, you know, wireless devices they use probe requests to announce their presence to access points. Essentially, your your, um, your, your laptops, your, your cell phones, whatever, uh, they all have a, a list of preferred networks on them that you've connected to before. And as you're, you know, as you're walking around, uh, or, or just you know, as long as the wireless is enabled, uh, there's a there's a good chance that they use active probing. That probe frames will be issued at regular intervals for each network. So, you know, it'll it'll send out these probe requests that have um, that essentially is, is, is seeing if one of these access points that you've connected to before is nearby. And if it is, you presumably will get some kind of response from the access point, and that's how your device knows to connect to it. Uh, there's also passive probing. Uh, we'll go more about that later. Uh, and, and passive probing, they actually just they don't do that, but there are ways. And there's been a lot of research into uh, uh, how to actually kind of force them to do that. So, um, you know, what's in a probe request? Well, you know, a probe request sent from a device contains, I mean, three real um, basic pieces of information that are actually really powerful when combined together. Uh, for one thing, you know, because it is a wireless packet, it's going to have a MAC address that's associated with the device. It, there's also going to be the time at which the probe request is issued. It will have a timestamp. And finally, and this is implicit, this isn't actually in the packet, but uh, it's simply because your wireless uh, sniffer is within range of the device where you're sniffing packets from, you, you know something about the location of that device. Uh, so, you know, if, if, if your device is... Uh, 
if, if you've sent a packet and, and, and you have a MAC address, you know that, that that device must be somewhere within the single range of the sniffer that captured it. So, I mean, we can use this for, uh, I mean, just to demonstrate how powerful this is, uh, we should talk about a technique called ingress-egress tracking. So, I want you to consider the following example. Uh, this is kind of something that's, it's hard to just kind of describe without using examples, so I, I, I'm gonna like, kind of do it this way. But I think a really good, a really good way of uh, thinking about the ingress-egress tracking method is, is by thinking about the New York City subway, right? So, can you guys see my mouse? Can you not see my mouse? Okay, cool. Yeah, so this is like a really confusing map thingy, so I'm gonna just point at things with my mouse. Um, but you see here, like, this is the New York City subway, right? And you have a series of stations. You know, you, you walk in at the station, you get on the subway, and then somewhere on the other side of the map, you'll pop out. So if you were to place a, a, a packet sniffer at each and every single subway station, and that would give you, essentially, if you were to sniff a, a certain device going in, and also see it come out at a different location, that would give you an entry point and exit point into the subway system. So, I mean, what that actually gives us is a route traveled. You know, so if, if you see uh, someone come in over here and you see them pop out over here, that means they, 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 you pretty much know for, uh, for certain that they traveled this way. So, I mean, there, there's a lot of like, um, there's a lot of like really uh, uh, good information that this actually gives you. I mean, for example, you can actually use this to calculate the routes of travel for all passengers using the subway during a given day. I mean, that's really powerful stuff. And all just because we're capturing three, you know, two items of data and using it to derive a third. Um, you know, and if you want to take that a step further, you know, think about it, if you were to ca um, sort these into categories and, and, and keep a database of this stuff, and you were to select all MAC addresses uh, from trips where, you know, the entry time was between a certain, uh, between a certain time, let's say 9 and 10 a.m., and then, you know, going from one station to another, uh, then that would give you uh, potentially commuting patterns. You know, if you could, you know, further sort this into categories, you could, you could, uh, you know, if, if you've seen the person take this route for the first time, they might not be, like, live in the city, whereas if, if you see them take the route every morning, they're probably a commuter. So already, you know, just, just by drawing these very simple inferences uh, from, this, from this very simple data, we're able to actually have some really powerful analytical results. Um, you know, for example, distinguishing between uh, tourists and commuters or, you know, ruling out false positives in, in an investigation. You know, so imagine a world in which these devices are literally everywhere, you know, not just like the subway example, but I mean, you could see like, you know, certain like, you know, retail stores or something like that, or, or just literally everywhere. Well, the resulting data sets could be used to build profiles that include age, gender, socioeconomic status. I mean, you can tell a lot of, you know, just by where someone goes. So I guess the real question then is, uh, yeah, I mean, this is actually, this is actually some, a technique that's used to, you know, by retailers and marketing agencies quite commonly. Uh, there are a lot of products out there, um, that, that they use in, in, in shopping malls and stuff like that to, to keep track of, uh, of, you know, essentially calculate peak hours, you know, when you're entering a clothing store or, or something like that. So, um, but I mean, the, the, kind of the, the, the interesting thing about this is that by linking a location in time uh, to a common MAC address, uh, you, you can actually create a detailed um, identity. You know, you can pretty much know just about anything about someone using, you know, where they travel and, and, and the times they travel there. And arguably, that's, that's a lot more uh, powerful than just, you know, knowing their name or, or, or having, knowing who they are. So, you know, food for thought. Um, has anybody here read OPSEC for Freedom Fighters? It's uh, by the Grok. Yeah, it's actually, like, really cool. But, I mean, one of the points that he came out with, uh, that he, he pointed out, was that, you know, most cyber criminals actually get caught using old-fashioned police work. Uh, so that, you know, they essentially leak information using, because of poor OPSEC. You know, so they'll, 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 you know, do something with one identity and then they'll cross-contaminate with another identity by bragging on IRC to all their friends. And then, you know, sooner or later someone sees that and they're able to put two, two together and, you know, they essentially um, get done that way. So, I mean, an another common way that cyber criminals are identified is, is through distinct uh, behavioral profiles. You know, you, you, can, you can, you know, uh, mask your identity, you can, you can use a different alias, but your, your online behavior, for example, uh, is going to fit a certain profile and it's going to fit, uh, fit a certain pattern uh, that is, you know, pretty much, uh, that is going to, you know, carry over from identity to identity. So, you know, if you can imagine that this is a method w with which you could tie users, uh, you know, you could essentially uh, build behavioral profiles. If you were able to tie users' metadata to their identity, that's, that's pretty powerful stuff. So I guess the conclusion to draw here is that, you know, anyone who claims to protect privacy by only looking at your metadata, um, really, I mean, it's, it's, it, that is misleading. You pretty much are your metadata and your name is just a label for it. So I guess the challenge, though, is linking devices to people. How do you bridge that gap uh, between, you know, a, a MAC address and someone's, you know, actual, you know, who they are? And we'll go about that. We'll go more into that in uh, greater detail later. So uh, there are actually some really interesting uh, applications of this stuff to physical security. 
Um, you know, for example, um, it's, it's pretty trivial to use probe sniffing to detect unauthorized devices, and a lot of companies actually do this uh, to enforce their IT policies. So, you know, you might actually bring, you, you might have like a, a non-bring your own device policy, and they might be sniffing packets and matching against a whitelist of allowed devices, and then suddenly here you are with your, uh, with, with, with your, uh, you know, PlayStation Portable or whatever the heck it is, and, and, and they detect that, and they flag it, and they, you know, come hunt you down and, and confiscate it. But, I mean, you know, in, in a slightly more, um, you know, if you're going to apply this to, I guess, like a physical security context, I mean, there, you can also place, uh, you know, probe sniffers um, at building entrances and use that as part of a real-time IDS. So, essentially, the capture probe, probes are compared against a whitelist of unauthorized MAC addresses, or, of, or should I say authorized MAC addresses, and if the authorized MAC address uh, is captured, an alarm goes off. So, I mean, what this means is that if you're trying to gain unauthorized access to a building, turn your cell phone off, if possible. I mean, you shouldn't just carry around a device that's, you know, throwing out packets everywhere um, if it's not necessary. And if you do need to use a wireless device, which you probably will uh, at some point, uh, make sure that you spoof a MAC address of an authorized device, uh, so something that you've seen kind of in, in the area, uh, before the engagement begins, uh, because you, you don't want to be compromised because of your, uh, your device, essentially. So, um, Another really, uh, a very commonly used technique to gain access to, unauthorized access to a, to, to a building is tailgating. You know, so when, you, when you're out in, you know, a lot of people when they think of like physical security assessments, they picture guys in ninja suits, you know, climbing over walls and sniffing, uh, sniffing barbed wire and doing all this crazy stuff. But I mean, in reality, you know, doing that stuff in, in like a, an urban environment, for example, would, is, is not that possible. I mean, if, you know, imagine like just being in the middle of Chicago, you know, buildings everywhere and you try to like climb a building or something like that. It's not gonna work. A much more common approach is to hide in plain sight and to just tailgate in, you know, I mean, w different variations of that, of course, you know, spoof badges, uh, and so on and so forth, but the gist of it is, you know, wait for someone who's actually allowed to enter to walk in the door, and you just walk in behind them. So, um, I mean, to do this, uh, the, the preferable method, of course, is to wait for a gaggle of people to walk in the door, and you just kind of catch up to them and go in with them, because this places more social pressure um, on the people who are supposed to be checking to make sure you're not entering um, unauthorized. Um, and, and additionally, it's, it's just hard to keep track of more people at once. So, um, you, know, the, you know, it often works if, it's important to wait for a sizable crowd, we just, we just said that. Um, but yeah, I mean, this picture here really just kind of like, kind of exemplifies uh, what we mean by this. You know, if, imagine like you're this guy over here and, and he's just trying to catch up to this, oops, trying to catch up to this, uh, this door and, and get in behind this person. That's a lot more obvious and conspicuous than, you know, just you could be one of these, you know, people wearing a suit over on the left, kind of blending in with all these other guys. So. You know, the old school way of doing this is just to find a, a vantage point from which you can watch the building entrance. You know, so you might just like camp out in front of the entrance and wait for your opportunity to go in. Uh, you know, if you see a group of people moving toward the building, you join an attempt entry. It's kind of like the, the stakehouse that, they, that, that you see in like old, you know, detective movies and stuff like that. Um, the problems with, with this technique, although this is pretty much, you know, the industry standard, um, it's really inefficient. You waste resources by having an operator wait outside the building for hours and hours and hours. And, you know, not only that, uh, it's really risky. I mean, you, you know, if you saw some guy just sitting in the van in your parking lot for like four hours watching the front door, I mean, that's pretty sketchy, right? So, you know, the longer you wait outside the building, the more problems you have. You can reduce this risk uh, by, I think the best way is to look at this, this little diagram here. So if you see like there's this, you know, imagine that you're waiting in this little van, right, in the parking lot, and you, you know, you see, you, you see the, like a group of people moving toward the door. So you're further away from the, from, the, from the door, so I mean, I guess like the, the risk of being detected during the preparation while you're waiting for your opportunity to go in is greatly d reduced that way. But if you move closer, if you move closer, um, you know, it's, it's uh, well, it's greatly reduced, you know, when you're further away. But at the same time, you increase risk of detection during the execution, because as you're trying to catch up with this crowd of people to go in the door, you know, now you have to sprint across the parking lot. So, you know, let's say that you're one of those people moving toward the door, right? And you see some guy just get out of the van and sprint toward you to catch up across the parking lot. That's going to attract a lot of attention. You might not, you know, think it's suspicious, but you are going to think it's weird and you are going to notice it. So, you know, if you reduce the path of travel, you know, you move yourself closer to the point of entry and are waiting for this opportunity, now you increase the risk of detection during the preparation phase because you're much, you're much more visible as you're just sitting there waiting uh, for your opportunity to get in. So, you know, you have a situation where, you know, you can park farther away and, you know, reduce your risk of detection during preparation and increase your risk of de uh, detection during execution or you can, um, you know, move closer, but now you're, you know, increasing the risk that you get picked up, uh, you know, by like a roving patrol or, or, or just generally get seen, you know, kind of camping out by the entrance. Uh, so, you know, of course, it, I think a much better solution to this uh, issue is to use a people counter to make informed decisions about, you know, when to attempt entry because, you know, rather than just trying to, you know, put guesswork into this or just waiting for an opportunity, use data. 
Uh, and this is actually a technique. Uh, so people counters are, are wireless devices. Uh, this is really pioneered by, by marketing agencies, uh, once again, in, in retail situations. It's a wireless device that sniffs uh, packets, and by doing this, it is able to tell how many people have visited a certain location at a certain time. Uh, so a very common application uh, to this uh, is, in, uh, is in retail stores. So like, you know, if, you, if you're in a shopping mall, you may go up to a mannequin, and this mannequin might actually have a packet sniffer in it. I mean, this is a pretty common practice, and, and, and what will happen is this way you can tell uh, which particular store displays are attracting attention and which ones aren't. And they use this to uh, essentially, you know, figure out what advertising techniques work and which ones don't. So, I mean, similarly, remember that people move in predictable patterns. You know, you have a, a rush of people going into work in the morning. You know, you might have a lunch crowd. You might have a, a you know, a smoke break later, in the, you know, periodically throughout the day. You know, people going in and out of the building. Uh, there's typically an evening rush, although that's not really as useful, uh, as useful because of people leaving a building rather than going back in. Um, but if, you know, you, typically what, you, what people do uh, when, they, when they attempt to, to, to tailgate is that they'll be aware of these patterns and you know, attempt to you know, plan on making entry at a time when you can expect there to be a lot of traffic. The problem is that these movement patterns are also very heavily dependent on company culture. So you know, it varies from place to place, from day to day, uh, and you, know, you can't really predict it, and you still, even if you're, you're aware of these, these patterns, um, you're wasting a lot of time just sitting around. Uh, so of, of course, you know, using data is definitely the better way to do this. So you know, as we said, people counters are frighteningly applicable to, uh, to physical, physical security assessments. So, I mean, if you, if you just say, uh, you know, take one of these people kind of things, you know, just have a small device and you just casually walk up to a door and, you know, have a smoke break and accidentally drop this thing in the bushes or something like that, uh, and then sniff uh, probe packets for, you know, a day or two, you could actually have, um, you know, build analytics. So, like, see, you might have actually predicted the lunch crowd to kind of go out around noon, but this company is just really strange and everyone seems to be going in and out at 3 p.m. You wouldn't have known that if you hadn't actually gathered data beforehand. And the coolest thing about this is you don't actually have to be there as you're gathering this data. So you can figure out the optimal points of entry without actually being close to the location. So um, another, another interesting thing you can do is uh, location tracking. This is the use of uh, uh, sniffing wireless traffic and, and, and using that to track the locations of, of, of both base stations or client devices and access points. Uh, I guess the two common, most common approaches to this are GPS cross-referencing and trilateration. So, I mean, GPS cross-referencing, I mean, that's essentially the traditional war driving techniques that we talked about before. Uh, you, you basically take a GPS tracker and a wireless packet sniffer and you combine them together. And that allows you to, you know, essentially uh, combine data sets, the wireless data set, which is your MAC address timestamp and other metadata from the packet. And then you combine that with a GPS position and you're able to, um, you know, essentially uh, plot the location of, of devices on a map. So you, you can render really cool looking things like this. Which you see all these networks and devices. Um, you know, so once again, this is a tried and tested technique. Uh, there are a lot of you know awesome tools available for this: Kismet, NetStembler, Insider, Wiggle, etc. Um, it's it's pretty applicable to physical security for the same reasons that uh, that war driving are, uh, especially red team assessments, because I mean it's useful for scope definition. Uh, it allows you to map attack surfaces, and you know it's great for device discovery. Uh, the other technique, and, and this is something that's that's more like bleeding edge, is trilateration. You know, um, so. Essentially, trilateration is the use of geometry and uh, distance to figure out the location of a point on a plane. Uh, so in other words, what that means is if you have, I think the best way to really explain this, um, can you guys kind of see this little dot in the middle of the, the graph there? Can anyone not see the dot? So I can probably zoom in. No, I can't. All right, well, just assume there's a dot there. Um, so we have like these three, these, these three circles, right? And, and the, I guess the layman's way to explain this is you can kind of see how, how they're overlapping in this area. And you know, by calculating where that overlap is occurring, uh, you, know, you can figure out where something is located. So the way that you'd apply this to uh, trilateration is by using um, RSSI um, is, uh, you know, as a metric to, to judge distance. So there's a really awesome researcher, uh, Jonathan Chizox, who uh, did some research on this. And, and the first thing he wanted to identify was whether or not power level is actually, um, is, is actually you know, a, a valid, a valid metric for which you can through which you can measure things. Um, by the way, in case you're in case you're wondering, uh, the received signal strength indication (RSSI) is the power level received by a wireless antenna. Uh, so essentially, you can you can think of it as you know how strong is the signal coming from this device uh, from which we are sniffing packets. Uh, if you convert RSSI to DVM, uh, you can use it to measure distance. Uh, the problem is that you know as Shazak uh, found, there's actually no noticeable correlation between RSSI and real distance. The reason for this is that there's a lot of interference and, and, and other you know, variables that cause you know, fluctuations in the signal strength. 
Uh, if you've ever used air dump and you see like the, 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 the TX powers, they move around a lot. They're not, you know, consistent. They can, they, they jump and sometimes it looks almost unexplicit. And the more environmental factors you factor into this, the worse it gets. So statistical correction is required for this to work. Um, you know, I guess so one of the, the techniques that, uh, uh, Shazox came up with, with two techniques. One is this, uh, naive approach to wireless tri trilateration. And essentially it works by placing, uh, two, pa uh, three packet sniffers in a, in, in a triangle like this. So you, you see, each of these dots up here represents a packet sniffer, and you know the idea is that you try to find uh, some device that's kind of in between them using trilateration. Uh, so, you know, I mean, he figured out that if you convert the R sub values to distance and then uh, normalize, you know, use normalized power, and essentially what normalized if, by taking normalized approach, what we mean is that, well, I mean, the best way to explain this really is by example. I mean, let's say that we, for, for the sake of argument, uh, this device that we're sniffing packets from is in the center of the, the triangle. So we, we're, we're saying that. Uh, that it's equidistant from all three points. And the reason why we're going to say that is so we don't have to give this example with like different um, DBI measurements. So it's equidistant and we've captured uh, three, uh, three, three packets with uh, DBI ratings, uh, negative uh, 56 DBI, which is the strongest, uh, negative 61, of course the least uh, strong uh, single strength reading would be negative 69 DBI. So if we essentially create radii or radiuses of the circle uh, you know, calculate how long that would be using, um, using distance or using the, the DBI to, to, to create a distance. And, you know, you first you see this radar, but the, the circles still do not intersect. Then, you know, you just discard that value and you move on to the next one. So now we try it with a negative 61 DBI, right? And, you know, we're, we're kind of getting there, we're kind of getting there, but at the same time, uh, we're not quite there yet because these, these uh, as you see, the circles are not intersecting. So we discard that value as well. Finally, we, we use uh, the, the negative 60 DBI, next, seven, uh, <laughs> negative, 60, negative 69 DBI to calculate the distance. And you know you essentially use this to create the circles and you see there's, there's actually some intersection happening here. And this intersection, um, because they do intersect, now you use these values and you assume that the device is somewhere in this, in this uh, area here that's being covered by the, uh, the blue circle, the uh, yellow circle, and the red circle. So, I mean, this actually works, uh, well, I mean, it works, but not very well, right? I mean, what uh, Shazox found was that the margin of error of this is actually up to 100 meters in some cases, which, you know, is effectively useless, right? Because if you're trying to figure out where something is, that's hardly accurate. Um, so a better approach is to use a weighted average. So I guess the, 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 the easiest way to think about this, um, and, and this is uh, probably the coolest thing about Shazox's study, was that if you take the end most powerful RSSI values uh, or discard every RSSI value under a certain threshold, this will actually reduce the average error to below 50 meters uh, without any fine tuning. And with fine tuning, and that's the key word there, fine tuning, uh, you reduce the average error to below 10 meters, which is actually startlingly accurate. Uh, the problem is that, you know, as, as you know, we mentioned, uh, there is fine tuning required, so you can imagine that's probably not going to work that well outside of a lab environment. So it's, it's definitely something that's still in its developmental stages. So um, I guess the advantage is if you wanted to, you know, track a, a wireless device using, using trilateration, um, well, I mean, the weighted average approach is, is pretty accurate when fine tuning is used, but you know, RSSI is still you know a very inconsistent power indicator, and it's definitely sensitive to environmental obstruction or interference. Um, there's definitely like the possibility. Uh, I think something that needs to be explored more is using more than three points to see if you can improve the the accuracy that way. Um, but yeah, at, at its you know, as far as like applications to physical security, I mean, it's it's arguably more trouble than it's worth. Hey, Sean, um, <laughs> but it only works indoors if obstructions aren't present, uh, and so it's really in its developmental stages. Um, so I guess you know we, we spoke about uh, um, you know how you can build profiles, uh, essentially you know profiles of, of behavior just by like you know tracking wireless devices that people are carrying. Uh, but I, I guess, you know, that, that kind of begs the question, can you actually link devices to people? You know, given, given a, a device, can you actually figure out who's using it or vice versa? And the answer is, well, I think before we go further, we have to think about the ethical considerations associated with this. Uh, you know, because, you know, the minute you start talking about bridging a, 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 the gap between this uh, identity of, of a person and the device they're using and their metadata, uh, you know, you, I mean, this, this is something where if you do this without consent, I mean, it's pretty much always considered unethical. unethical. Um, the question, though, is it worth it? Is it worth doing? And, you know, I, I think a lot of marketing agencies, law enforcement agencies, you know, people who have interest in this stuff would definitely say yes. Um, you know, potential reasons, you know, arguments for doing it. You know, you, you want to spy on somebody, but you don't know what, what phone they're, they're using. Uh, or you need to target someone very specific. Or, 
you know, if you're a marketing agency, of course, they just want to enhance your customer experience and sell you stuff. So, um, you know, that, that, that works. That, that's a pretty good reason for doing it. As far as legal justifications for doing it, you know, if, if you've consented to it, either as part of a terms of service agreement, actually, this is a pretty, pretty interesting practice when you, when you go into, uh, if you've ever used like free Wi-Fi, has anyone ever just accepted like a captive portal or something like that, like a retail store? No one? Oh, he has, okay. So, I mean, really, um, it, it's pretty funny because what they'll actually do is they'll bury something in the terms of service that consents, where, where, that basically by, by agreeing to this, you're consenting to having your movements tracked throughout the store. So like, you know, like Nordstrom or, or Macy's or something like that may want to see where you're going in the store and what kind of products you're interested in. You know, and of course to sign up and, and get access to the free Wi-Fi, you have to give them your email. So then they'll use that to send you targeted advertisements later. Um, you know, of course, you know, you might, your employer might, you know, say that, yeah, you have to agree to, you know, having your, your activity monitored uh, in the workplace. Uh, you know, whether that actually, you know, entails, you know, physical tracking as well, it may or may not. Um, of course, if there's a warrant or equally powerful legal justification, uh, then, then that, you know, works as well. Uh, note to security consultants, don't try this stuff uh, without explicit authorization in the form of a SOW because you land yourself in really hot water for doing this. Um, but yeah, I mean, pretty much as, as far as this conversation goes, I, I, I think, uh, at least from, the from, from my perspective, uh, really just taking a neutral stance on this regarding the ethics of, of doing this. Uh, and instead, I, I think it's, it's better to just explore uh, whether or not it's possible to link uh, devices and identities to one another. And if it is possible, how feasible is it? You know, and then you guys can basically come up with your own conclusions about it and go from there. So um, Matthew Conche uh, at the International Symposium of Research in Gray Hat Hacking uh, released a, uh, a pretty awesome presentation called I Know Your MAC Address. And there's, a, um, there's actually a, a white paper that is about this as well. And what he figured out was that, well, he came up with this approach where if you visually identify targets, so you just say, oh, that guy, and then you just follow him for a while while sniffing packets, you know, so you, you, you monitor the wireless communication from the student, just follow him around for n minutes while keeping in transmission range. You know, eventually you're, you're going to see a MAC address that has been present with you as you're following this person for, you know, all n minutes. So eventually you'll see all the other MAC addresses, you know, fall away and there'll be this one MAC address left. So, I mean, this is, this is actually pretty cool because it demonstrates that it's using, you know, a relatively simple technique, you can have a, an accurate and a highly targeted means of linking a visual identity to someone's MAC address. You know, the drawbacks to this is one thing, it's creepy. It's actually called, dubbed the Wi-Fi stalker attack by um, Conche himself. And it requires considerable skill and training to do so without attracting attention or getting arrested. I mean, if you imagine just trying to, like, you know, do this technique, you know, you're, you're following some guy with your Yagi antenna or whatever, and just he's seeing you on every street corner. I, I mean, if someone was doing that behind me, I'd probably call the cops. I mean, just, just saying. So it also requires uh, close proximity to, to target, you know, and that, that's, that's uh, you know, never preferable. With that said, I think you know, this, this technique actually can be improved. The original Wi-Fi soccer attack came out in 2013. It's now 2017, and literally everyone has drones. No, I mean literally everyone has drones. Um, <laughs> so, do, so, I mean, let's talk about, you know, like hypothetically, if you wanted to, how would you improve your Wi-Fi stalking game? Uh, well, I mean, you can use facial recognition and drones for one. You know, this alleviates the problem of, of having to follow somebody around with an antenna. Um, you know, so it's, it's easier to be stealthy. Uh, physical exertion is not required, which is an amazing thing, I think. And it's slightly less creepy. But, I mean, it's still pretty creepy, right? If you see a little quadcopter following you around with a little... Less obviously creepy, what he said. <laughs> hard to, it's also hard to use indoors, right? I mean, I don't know if you've ever tried to fly like a, like a drone, but it's, it's, it's actually more challenging than you think. And, you know, it's action pro. You know, you may actually run into the person with the drone or, you know, clobber somebody. And you can only really monitor one target at a time, still. So, I mean, why stop here, I, though? I mean, what if we did the enhanced aerial Wi-Fi stalking attack advanced persistent threat style? Um, you know, so drones <laughs> equipped with facial recognition software, lots of them, split an aerial map into sectors, and each face gets a unique ID. You know, actually, I think at this rate, the better way of explaining this is not really by using... I'm going to load something up here really fast. I'm going to try to anyways. Okay, I'm actually going to have to put the mic down because I need to type. <laughs> Bear with me.
Oh, can you guys actually see this? All right, can you see this better now? All right, so like we have this grid here, and I want you to imagine that each tile on this grid is a, it's, it's just a location on a map, and, and you're kind of looking at this from a top-down view, and each of these points here is, is a sector, and in each of these, pack, uh, each, of these point, each of these sectors are two items, a camera and a packet sniffer. So you have a camera and packet sniffer in each point, right? And then you also have uh, this guy here, Bob. So we're going to, you know, Bob, we kind of have this as an order pair here, right? Where there's this thing C9, and we're assuming C9 maps to a map, MAC address. I didn't actually put a MAC address because, you know, that would be kind of hard to, uh, if you, if you, it, would, it would essentially take up the whole square, it'd be hard to render on the screen. So just pretend C9 is a MAC address, you know, a MAC address C9. And we have uh, Bob. So Bob is, is, you know, represents the, like, essentially an identity tied to someone's face. Um, so for the purpose of this demonstration, we can see that uh, Bob is linked to MAC address C9. Uh, but the algorithm that we're going to use to actually link these two things is unaware of that. Uh, but the, so the parentheses and, and uh, there are really just, just for, uh, as a visual aid for us. So Bob is, you know, moving around this map, kind of like this, and, and, and each, um, you know, let's say this is like a, a, a one minute interval. Bob moves from location to location. And you know, just kind of intuitively, right? If we look at if we look at where Bob is, we only have one MAC address there, and that's MAC address C9. So we can, you know, just kind of like, you know, it, it's implied there that you know MAC address C9 belongs to Bob. Now, let's look at let's look at a different example, which would be two people in the square. If I can type correctly, there we go. So now we have now we have four items in this sector at the top left. Uh, these four items being uh, you know, MAC address C9, MAC address A1, Bob, and Mary. So, you know, we, you know, we can, once again, we have these parentheses here to aid us, uh, but an actual tracking algorithm would not be able to see uh, that, you know, these two things are tied to one another. So it would just look like there's two MAC addresses and two, um, two visual identifiers in the sector, and you wouldn't be able to tell, um, you know, whether, you know, w which one is linked to what just off the bat. However, notice that, you know, after, after both of them move, um, kind of like in, in either direction. So, so Mary has now moved, you know, to the right by one sector, and Bob has moved down. If we're trying to, you know, keep track of Bob, and now we see that the only MAC address left um, is, you know, the, at MAC address C9, then we know that, you know, you can tie MAC address C9 to Bob, and those two um, are linked to one another. You know, similar, similarly, if we look with more people, right? So now we have now we have five people that we're keeping track of. Um, as we said before, the, the parentheses, you know, they, they're really just there for us, but we can see that there are these people with their MAC addresses. But to an, an, an algorithm that's actually trying to track these people, uh, you would not see these, uh, be able to tell that these people are linked together. You would just see five MAC addresses and five visual identifiers. And it would take kind of longer. So now that they've each moved, and this movement is, is, is randomly calculated, by the way, um, you, you see that they've moved. Uh, and, and now, if we're still trying to figure out where Bob is, now we see Bob and Mel are both in the same uh, sector, as well as their MAC addresses. But we still don't know which of those two MAC addresses belongs to Bob. And, you know, now Bob's in this sector all by, by himself. And, you know, the only, the only thing left, the only intersection between, you know, the, the set of all items in this, uh, uh, this final sector where Bob is and the, the sector in which Bob started out is, this, is the set containing the MAC address C9 and the visual identifier Bob. Therefore, you know that Bob must have MAC address C9. So, I mean, if you actually implement this into, um, into a tracking algorithm, right? I'm just going to type this in with one hand. Type in visual ID Bob. So, I might have to zoom out a bit. All right, can you guys still see what's going on pretty well? Anyone not able to see the text? All right, you can all see the text, great. Um, so yeah, you know, as we said before, we have these, these, these uh, you know, five visual identifiers and five MAC addresses. Uh, so what the, the way that this algorithm is going to work is that it's going to first sweep this area and look for Bob. You know, Bob is now found right here in this sector. So fo the, atten you know, the attention of the, the algorithm is focused on, on, on this sector. You then fast forward the camera by about um, the cameras by about uh, one minute, uh, but the algorithm is still focusing on this sector. It now searches uh, each of these neighboring areas on the graph. Uh, up here, which would actually is this sector here, then it's, it, it, would, it would look at, uh, at this one, then this one, and just kind of keep going until, until Bob is found, which Bob would be found here. 
you know, as this, this, um, this particular case uh, resolved itself very quickly, as you see the target MAC address has already been identified as uh, C9, if you're able to see that. And I'll just zoom in a little bit so, so that you can, if I can. Yeah, the target, you know, MAC address has already been identified as C9. But, you know, it doesn't always, it doesn't always go that quickly, right? So if you, if you do this, so we'll, we'll try this again, but you know, if you, if you see this algorithm, it, it, it may take a few tries, but each time, you eventually, it is deterministic, you will arrive at the, at the MAC address that, you know, is associated with the visual identifier that you're looking for. So, you know, we start out here, and then, you know, the possible candidates just ruled out to, these are all resolving fairly fast, let me try to find an example where it's not, and, this is totally the demo gods right now. Like, you shall have good luck when finding this. Yeah, so here, well, how about that? <laughs> it's actually literally just working on the first try every time. But usually, I mean, this, it has to fall it around for a bit, right? And, you know, within each, um, essentially, if you do this long enough, uh, you can essentially take, you know, like a visual identifier and then you map it to a MAC address in that way. So, I mean, if you think about the ways that something like that could actually be used, um, uh, well, I, I guess uh, first, like the the limitations of this, for example, would be that that uh, it doesn't really account for signal bleed between the two uh, the different sectors um, on the map. Of course, it's not really necessary because if if you track this thing long enough, I mean, you're eventually going to lose that signal from the other places. Uh, but um, and it also doesn't work really if two individuals are always you know traveling together in in one place. However, uh, if two people are always taking the same path, and it does tell you that uh, there there's probably some kind of link between these two individuals, so it doesn't really matter. Um, and of course, it doesn't work with individuals who have more than one device. Although, once again, if you start seeing you know this, this kind of triad moving around, um, you can start to draw inferences from that. Um, so, I mean, if, if if you think about like ways in which this could be used, I mean, so for example, you know, think about a city where there are like security cameras uh, everywhere. I mean, like New York's a really great example of that. Um, you know, London is notorious for just having security cameras on every every block. In fact, speaking of London, uh, there was you know if you, you guys read the news a few years ago, there was like uh, Actually, they, they recently decided to, to end a program in which they had uh, wireless packet sniffers just sitting in uh, sitting in trash cans. So you, you'd go to throw out your rubbish, and they just kind of capture your capture your MAC address and stuff like that. So I mean, the infrastructure is really already there in order to do something like this. So I mean, it, it just just using existing infrastructure, you could really do this. So um, I guess the conclusion from this is that tracking client devices is actually like really easy, uh, depending on the methods that you're using, uh, and and you can use it you know using pretty uh, pretty small, uh, simple data points, uh, and and by doing that, uh, actually gather some really really insightful uh, results. And, you know, and you know this is pretty much evidenced by the, the sheer number of products out there that, that that do this. You know, both like in the, the the marketing sectors and also in other places. And you know, often the simplest measures are the most reliable and effective. Uh, as for linking devices to people and actually like being able to figure out, um, you know, being able to link a a, a behavioral profile or or, or an identity to, to someone's identity. Um, you know, I mean, there are a couple of ways of doing this. You can take the uh, the approach of just having to having someone agree to it, um, you know, and then essentially they could, they consent. You know, that's the, what we were talking about the terms of service stuff. Or I mean, you can do do something more invasive, you know, which is like the the, the algorithms that we were just talking about uh, more recently. So I, I think in, in terms of this stuff, large organizations with vast resources definitely have the advantage. But as you can st see, there's still like a lot of like really simple methods that you can use. So I mean, that's pretty much it. I think we finished about. 10 minutes early, but any questions? What's up? Yes, um, the, the first three octets of a MAC address are, the, the first three octets are an OUI, so that maps to the manufacturer. Uh, yeah, actually. Um, so, you know, if you wanted to and you, and you were able to, and one, one really cool thing you could do, I guess, with that is that if you wanted to just, you know, get a list of everyone here who uses Android versus, versus Apple or, or, or other, I mean, that, that's something you could definitely use, use the OUI prefix for. What's up? It, it varies. And, and that's a really good question because it, it, it tells you how often you can actually gather this, this data point. Um, and depending on the device, there are devices that don't probe actively. So if you're, I mean, we haven't for some reason, and I don't, I, there's really no reason for this in my opinion, but that's just, that's just opinion. We still haven't reached a point where, where we're all just using, 
we're neglecting passive probing, I guess, for convenience or whatever. But uh, I mean, there's some devices that use passive probing where they just wait for 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 beacons uh, for an access point before they start the probing process and before they start attempting to connect to something on on their on their preferred network list. But yeah, it does vary from device to device. There's there's some uh, leeway in the implementation there. Uh, you. Excellent question. So, um, so uh, the thing is that I mean, there was a really uh, I probably should link to this, but there's there's a study uh, that was recently released uh, by it's called Why. So essentially, there you when you when the when the um, when the programs go out, although the um, in, in a lot of cases, al although the MAC address uh, varies from uh, from, from packet to packet, there's still a sequence number that's associated with each packet. So the MAC address changes, but there's a, a sequence number that, um, that that's still associated with each MAC address. So because of that, um, that that kind of breaks it. And also there, you, there's uh, and this, this is this is a little you know it doesn't work quite as well, but there's also you can use like hardware fingerprinting. So you can you can kind of you know based on the, the actual signal coming from the device, figure out that although the MAC address has changed, there's still like a fingerprint of this device that kind of looks similar. That's a really good question. Um, I don't believe so. I think it would just construct an overall profile from all this stuff. So it, it does throw a wrench in it that way. Yes, but unless unless you find a way of identifying the, uh, you know, mapping these things to to one thing. So if, if you're able to to, to see that uh, there's like a certain sequence number that's falling from, you know, like, and, and that doesn't change from from client device to client device. Or, or should I say, MAC address to MAC address? You can you can kind of lump them together and just assign your own like UUID or something to it and and tie them together that way. Uh, yeah, so that's that's exactly pretty much. Uh, anything else? Any more questions? Oh come on! <laughs> All right, well. I guess I guess if not, um, a little early, but yeah, that's pretty much it. Thanks, guys.